Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we follow our curiosity, diving deep into the familiar and the foreign. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, explore intriguing ideas, and have real conversations with the best guests. Ready for something different? Let's get started. In April of 1945, President Franklin D. Roosevelt wrote the final words that he intended to deliver to his beloved nation just two days after his death. He wrote, The only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Let us move forward with strong and active faith. These were the words that the 32nd President of the United States lived by. It was August 1921. FDR was enjoying a holiday at their Campobello Island family cottage in New Brunswick, Canada. FDR had enjoyed a full day of fun in the sun with his loved ones, but retired early to bed with chills and back pain. When he woke, he was gripped with the realization that life would never be the same again. His left leg was lagging, a telltale sign that he had contracted polio. Soon, he was paralyzed from the waist down, and this was a devastating diagnosis for the 39-year-old, but he had an unwavering resolve and faith in his ability to heal and cope with illness. FDR underwent years of therapy, particularly at Warm Springs, Georgia. He was relentless in his pursuit of finding his feet again, and through his optimism and belief in a positive outcome, he was able to teach himself how to walk with support of leg braces. In 1938, he founded the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which later became the March of Dimes, the work of which led to the development of polio vaccines. He also purchased Worm Springs, which now hosts a center for post-polio treatment. It provides vocational rehabilitation, long-term acute care, and inpatient rehabilitation for amputees and people recovering from spinal cord injuries, brain damage, and stroke. Franklin D. Roosevelt overcame this significant challenge through his own faith in himself, in his abilities and belief in a positive outcome. He brought his faith, hope, and optimism to his country too, serving an unprecedented four terms in office, guiding the United States through the Great Depression. Polio is such a devastating disease. It really could strike anyone without notice. Mm -hmm. But I've never known this about FDR. Yeah, it's quite remarkable, particularly considering the time. The world was a far less inclusive place, but it's thought that FDR's disability encouraged empathy among Americans. Mm. And think, too, that the medical treatments and knowledge were not nearly as advanced then. Anyone struck down by polio would definitely be well served to draw on their own faith. And from what I've read, FDR's was unshakable. Right, powerful, like Jose Salvador Alvarenga. Remember him from our survival episode, Staying Alive? Mm -hmm. Jose survived 438 days in a tiny boat. I don't think you survive as a castaway for this length of time without having some serious faith. Right, and let's be clear, faith is not the same as religion walker. Faith can involve religion, and the terms are often used interchangeably or hand in hand, but faith extends beyond religious boundaries. So what do you mean? Well, think about faith in the context of these familiar sayings, like, I have faith in you, or I have faith in my marriage. Well, that's nice to know on both counts. (laughs) It's a term that demonstrates a deep belief in someone or something, doesn't it? Exactly. Like keeping the faith that something good will happen or is on the horizon. Right. Like I have faith that our podcast is going to reach 100,000 years before the end of the year. Exactly. (laughs) Faith can be relied upon in all kinds of scenarios, not just like the one of President Roosevelt's. Certainly, though, it's during the bleakest of times that people do try to keep faith, whatever that might mean to them. And as I said, you can have faith without the religion. So true. Wikipedia actually puts it well. It says that faith is confidence or trust in a person, thing, or concept. In the context of religion, faith is belief in God or in the doctrines or teachings of religion. Okay, so kind of like we said. Right. Dr. Jeremy E. Sherman wrote an interesting analysis called Faith. What is it and who has it? He dug deep into the notion that faith stops any wondering. It's just there with you always. He also pointed out that faith is a virtue, something we aspire to possess. Yeah, that makes sense. Like saying, I have faith in God or Allah or another divine religious icon. It's a closed statement. And as we know, that kind of faith is something that is often very well regarded in society. Right. So faith is a pretty broad term. 
It's a bit of a tricky topic. There's so many interpretations of faith. Leanne Lewis Newman of Baylor University noted that faith is nearly impossible to define because the term means something different to everybody. She references a statement made by James W. Fowler, an American theologian and professor of theology of human development at Emory University, who said prior to our being religious or irreligious, we're already engaged with issues of faith. Whether we become non-believers, agnostics, or atheists, we're concerned with how to put our lives together with what will make life worth living. I think spirituality is what muddies the water a bit true. Spirituality is the state or quality of being dedicated to God, religion, or spiritual things, or values, especially as contrasted with material or temporal ones. So very different from faith itself, and more tightly bound to, but exclusive to religion. Hmm. Dr. Maya Spencer composed a personal exploration for the Royal College of Psychiatrists, where she claims that spirituality involves a recognition of a feeling or sense or belief that there is something greater than myself something more to being human than sensory experience, and that the greater whole of which we are part is cosmic or divine in nature. Spirituality means knowing that our lives have significance in a context beyond a mundane everyday existence at the level of biological needs that drive selfishness and aggression. It means knowing that we are a significant part of a purposeful unfolding life in our universe. I resonate with that, Walker. So I think it's safe to say that you aren't a particularly religious individual, Harris. Is that right? Yeah, I would say I'm more of a spiritual gal. S-B-N-R, as they say, (laughs) spiritual but not religious. I have a foundation in religion, though. I was confirmed Catholic. I raised my kids Anglican. And I do have faith that there are larger forces at work. Well, interestingly, although there is a trend towards using faith, spirituality, and religion interchangeably, Leanne Lewis Newman suggests that faith is a basis required for both spirituality and religion. Well, that totally makes sense to me. Faith requires us to have deep trust and unwavering belief that doesn't require proof Mm. or evidence. Actually, philosophy professor Vance G. Morgan says exactly that. Faith is not belief without evidence. Faith is belief when evidence may point in a particular direction, but is not complete or exhaustive. It's such a complex subject, which can understandably become more difficult when faith and science meet. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anyone better suited to tackle this than Dr. Joshua Brown. Dr. Brown is a professor in psychology, neuroscience, and cognitive science, and serves as the director of the program in neuroscience at Indiana University Bloomington. In addition to his academic and research responsibilities, Dr. Brown has also helped to found the Global Medical Research Institute, which according to its website, exists to bridge the gap between science and faith. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Dr. Brown. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, we're really excited to speak with you today. So you have a fascinating personal story, which sparked your interest in medical miracles and miraculous healing. Do you mind sharing that with us? Sure. So, I mean, I can tell you that doing research on claims of miraculous healing was not something I just woke up one morning and I thought, oh, wouldn't that be fun to do? I was I was uh, about 20 years ago uh, working on building my career as a cognitive neuroscientist. I was doing a lot of functional brain imaging and uh, some studies in non-human primates and really trying to understand higher cognitive function in the brain and how that works. And uh, the concept of miracles was nowhere on my radar. And so one night I went to bed and when I woke up the next morning, I discovered that I was not in my own bed. I was in the back of an ambulance. I'd had a seizure. And so they whisked me off to the ER and about two and a half weeks later, uh, just as my first child was born, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And that's, of course, ironic because I'm a neuroscientist. And so as I looked at the results, I realized very quickly that medically there just wasn't really any hope. Um, I could expect to live several years, perhaps. Uh, And even with chemo and radiation and surgery, there really wasn't any hope of living much beyond that. And so that all was a a, a massive shock. And I remember just sitting in my car and reading the radiology reports and and completely losing it. Yeah. <laughs> I, sc- I screamed. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not surprised. And so that 
began the process in my mind of it sort of raised the question, well, the, you know, do miracles happen today? Because I, I suddenly you find needed myself one. needing one. I need mm-hmm. one. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And yeah. so that, uh, that sort of led me and my wife both into this, um, into this world of looking at miracles. And so we're both academics. I'm, you know, professor in the sciences. She's a professor of religious studies, Harvard PhD and all that. And, and so uh, we suddenly found ourselves looking very carefully. And of course, you know, we're still academics. I'm still a researcher, so I'm not just going to swallow something whole because someone says so. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I'm very interested. And Mm -hmm. so that, that's really how it started. Okay. What was sort of the next step as you digested what was actually happening to you and within your brain. What did that lead you and your wife to do? Well, I think at that point we, you know, neither of us. We had both grown up in a in Christian churches, and, but the idea of miracles was never really part of our experience. It just wasn't something that was talked about. You know, it was very much the sort of you know, you, you have to have the right beliefs and you right. go to church Sunday morning and, you know, and then, and that's it. And so we started asking around, we said, well, you know, I don't know if miracles happen nowadays, but it, we asked all our friends, people in the church, we said, do you know, like, is it, are the miracles happening anywhere? Like, mm-hmm. is there any, you know, and look, I have nothing else. I have nothing to lose here. So exactly. I'll do, like, I will travel anywhere. I will do anything. I will pay any price um, because what else am I going to do? Get ready mm-hmm. to die. And and we had other friends who said, well, you know, you, you should, in fact, get ready to die and make sure you die well. And, you know, don't lose your Christian faith when you die and, mm-hmm. you know, this horrible disease. And, you know, which I understand the sentiment and and I appreciate the concern. And at the same time, I had other friends who said, well, there's a guy over here and, you know, he preaches and prays for people and people seem to get miraculously healed. And so I said, well, let's go check it out. Absolutely. My wife had given birth to our first child uh, about four days after I had the first seizure. I can't even imagine. Well, it was... It was horrible. Yeah, think, is, yeah. That's the word so, for it. Yeah. My so my daughter was two and a half weeks old when I got the diagnosis, and so we we just put her on a plane. We put her in a car. She slept really well, and and we just traveled anyway. We traveled all over the U.S. We went to you know any place we heard that there were miracles happening. We just said, well, let's go check it out. Yeah. And to be honest, some of the experiences we had were a little bit weird. Um, and some of the some of the groups we visited didn't didn't seem to add up uh, right. in the sense that it wasn't clear that what was being claimed was really what was going on. And right, uh, but there were some places where we, I mean, we felt. I mean, first of all, people were genuinely concerned. Like these were genuine people, and. And this wasn't some kind of, I don't know, scam or something. And right. and I talked to a number of people along the way, at various places I went. I traveled all over the U.S., um, parts of Canada. I ended up going all over Latin America, Africa. And, and the more I traveled, the more I saw things that I couldn't really explain medically. And... And so that, uh, I mean, I remember at one point I was in, I was in a meeting in Seattle. This is probably, I don't know, early 2004. And, and of course I was going to these meetings because I was desperate. I was, and I was looking to see, you know, are there miracles and, and what's real? Like, are these really real or is this just people getting excited? Uh, well, I remember watching uh, these people go up on stage in a healing meeting and, and the guy praying for them. Uh, who's since passed away, but he he was uh, praying and uh, and he said, "Okay, you know, what do you need healing from?" And someone said, "Well, I've got you know part of my kneecap missing. I had a skateboarding accident." And so the guy prayed. He just sort of laughed, like 
like, oh yeah, you know, another one of these. And and I thought, how can you be so nonchalant about this? And yeah. so then, you know, after a few moments, he said, fill your kneecap again. And the guy reached down and got a kind of a surprised look on his face and said, well, it's, yeah, it's there now. That's remarkable. And the guy, the, the guy who was doing the the brain sort of chuckled and said next and the guy walked off well i found this guy afterwards and i walked up to him and i said so i saw you on stage and and you know i was just curious like can you tell me more about your experience and he said well i don't know you know all i know is i had this accident and the doctors removed about a third of my kneecap and i could feel where it was missing and and while i was standing there it just suddenly wasn't missing anymore and i thought whoa oh hold up Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, how does that happen? But you know, missing bone parts do not just grow back, you know. Yeah. And I think I mean one of the questions people usually ask is well what about placebo effects? There are some things that I've seen that I would say, you know, there could be some placebo effect in there. Right? You're mm-hmm. in a meeting and there's, you know, you you feel that people care for you and there's some uplifting songs and and, you know, that, that kind of thing can help the pain feel a little better. And, Absolutely. And so I've, you know, I've been in meetings where people say, oh, you know, the pain feels a lot better. And I, my response to that is, well, that's great. You know, I'm really glad you're feeling better. You know, does that mean God did a miracle here? I don't know, but, you know, but I'm glad you're feeling better. Mm-hmm. And, and so there are cases like that. And there, are, but there are also cases where I look at that and I say, okay, I don't know. I mean, I've I've spent a long time studying science and neuroscience and and I don't really see how a missing part of a kneecap can grow back just like that. So, is it possible the guy was was, you know, misleading me? Maybe he wasn't missing part of his kneecap. Maybe you know, maybe he was exaggerating. And I don't know, but that that got me curious because I thought, okay, you know, I'm talking to people face to face and they're telling me this and Mm -hmm. what is really going on. And, and so I wondered, I thought, well, I'm a scientist and you know, what, what scientists do is you carefully investigate things and try to figure out what's going on. And so I thought, okay, well, where, you know, who's done that work of investigating things like this to see what's really gone on. And, Mm -hmm. and I really couldn't find like, the Catholic Church has done a fair amount of work looking at miracles. So you have like the Lord's Medical Bureau and the Shrine of Lourdes, and you have, uh, you know, the Vatican's process for determining miracles, which for the Vatican is mainly about the questions of canonizing saints, which, right. uh, I mean, I grew yeah. up in a Protestant tradition. I have, you know, I, I appreciate my Catholic friends, uh, but I, I it's less important to me whether you canonize a saint or not. Shall we exactly. Say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was just curious, like, what's really happening here? Yeah, and, from a scientific perspective. Yeah, well, and I yeah. think medical specifically. Right. I mean, medical right. and okay. scientific, and mm-hmm. the, the two are close. They're not quite the same, but right. So anyway, in the middle of all this, I kept traveling, and and then the the next, I think it was it was also about late February of two thousand four. I ended up going on a trip with this uh, one of these groups that I had, you know, attended the meetings of. And they said, well, we're going to go to Cuba, spend a week and, you know, have some healing meetings. And and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll find a miracle in Cuba. So so I signed up and and uh, the first day we got there, there's maybe 15 of us. And and uh, we had, we found ourselves in a little storefront church in Havana. And I was sort of kind of just wide eyed, you know, watching what's okay. What are these people going to do? There's, you know, like I said, maybe 15 or so in this group, kind of a small group. And, mm-hmm. and so we're standing around this church and, and somebody comes in. So one, one of the people on this team and says, Oh, there's a blind guy in the sidewalk, you know, let's go see if he'd like prayer for healing. And I thought, well, this ought to be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love so, your attitude. Yeah. <laughs> so I walked outside and watched and, and several of the people on this team offered to pray for this guy, you know, fairly gently, not aggressively. And they said, mm-hmm. well, you know, would, would it be okay if we just offered some prayers for your eyesight? And the guy was kind of, kind of a little taken aback, but like, was like, okay. And so 
and I watched and, you know, th- and this guy had a cane. He's walking down the street with a cane in his hand. And within a few minutes, he started reading the license plates off these 1950s vintage cars that were parked there in Old Havana. And I watched this and I was like, what? That's cra- That gives me chills. It, well, it, it gave me it's, chills it's remarkable. too. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine witnessing that firsthand. Well, it it had a profound effect on me yeah. Um, because I thought, okay, is it possible that they planted this guy and they made Mm -hmm. the thing up? But, but I mean, the people that, as I was getting to know the people on this group, I mean, these were people who were not all that different from me in the sense that, you know, they're Christians and they're like, well, let's go travel and see what's happening and, and, you know, find out. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't see how these people are going to just go planning. And and the thing is like, where's the, where's the money? I mean, if you were going to do that, why would you do that? You you try to shake somebody down for money and like, nobody was asking. I mean, of course, like if you want to support, you know, these groups that do this thing, you can, but no, I wasn't, we weren't getting a hard sell. So I thought this right. is, this just, it doesn't add up that this was all staged or something. So, mm-hmm. so that got me even more curious. Like, what is going on? Like Mm -hmm. what medically is going on with people? And I should probably come back to the story of what happened to me medically. So, Mm -hmm. um, so I was getting MRIs done every three months because the doctor said, well, not really anything we can do for you. We'll just, you know, keep an eye on it. And so, you know, see how it grows and try to figure out how much time you have. And they sent me to a neurosurgeon and the neurosurgeon said, well, you know, the next step would be to do a biopsy, but um, if we do a biopsy, it might kill you because it's pretty close to an artery. And and I said, and supposing you did it, how would that change my outcome medically? And they said, well, it wouldn't really. Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't. Yeah. So, I said, so what's the point? Why take that risk? Yeah. So I was totally open to medical treatment, but it just, there was nothing to be done. So. Right. So they kept doing MRIs, and three months after the initial diagnosis, they did another MRI. And by this point, I had gone to these prayer meetings, and I had been prayed for for healing. And I had some experiences that really kind of surprised me, because I I usually am not a very sort of excitable person. I tend to be kind of the rational scientist nerd type. And Mm -hmm. so I went to some of these meetings, and as people prayed for me, I feel these strange sensations, like almost as if I grabbed an electrical wire. And and sometimes the sensations were so powerful, I found I had difficulty standing up. And and I thought, this is this is very unusual. And, and I don't, I mean, I don't know what to make of this. Mm-hmm. It feels like a powerful experience, like, you know, like far outside of what I'd experienced before. So I thought, well, you know, maybe somehow that's what miracles feel like. And I know I'd heard other people report that they felt sensations like electricity and tingling and heat. And I thought, well, you know, maybe that's a, you know, a sensation associated with something, some kind of healing process or something. And Mm -hmm. so I went back to the, you know, to get this three month follow up MRI. And I thought, well, you know, let's see what happened. And so they did the MRI and they gave me the results back. And the results said that it's as bad as ever. There's still a tumor, still going to die, basically. So I thought, uh, yeah, what is it all for? Yeah. Like, what am I doing? You know, yeah. do I, maybe I should just get ready to die. And, but then I looked, you know, and by this point, my daughter's like, three months old and yeah. you know here's my wife and I thought well really don't want to die I really don't want my daughter to not have a dad yeah I don't want my wife to be a widow so what else is there and so I, I basically decided that I was just going to keep on pursuing miracles and I would either get healed or I'd die trying yeah but I wasn't going to give up so I continued to travel and the, the people who I went with to Cuba said, well, if you thought that was fun, you know, you should come with us to Brazil because there are way better miracles in Brazil, you know, like okay. this is okay in Cuba, but, you know, Brazil. And I thought, okay. That's where it's at. Let's go. <laughs> so, so I signed up and we ended up in this city called Belém, which is around the yeah. mouth of the Amazon River. And uh, I ended up 
with this, you know, a larger group in a, in an outdoor stadium. And so they were preaching and uh, there are about 5,000 people in the audience. And at one point they said, well, if you need healing in your body, go on over to that little tent over there. And so I went over there, but of course I was part of the team, you know, I had a badge on and, and so as soon as I got over there, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll find a miracle over here. And as soon as I got there, a whole line of people formed in front of me. Uh, so I and a friend I'd made from the last trip in Cuba just stood there and started praying for people one after the other. And one of the people in this line was a probably about a 10-year-old boy. And, and I started asking him what was wrong with him. And then I looked at his eyes and they were just white. Oh, okay. He had a caretake you know guardian there who said well you know he's yeah he's blind yeah and i you know waved a hand in front of his face can you see anything nope and so my friend and i began to pray and it was very simple prayers just you know in jesus name eyes uh eyes be healed (laughs) yeah (laughs) very like very very simple and so within, a, I'd say about 10 to 15 minutes, he started to see, first he could see lights. So I said, well, how many lights do you see? And there were these big stadium light posts and there were five of them. And he looked around and said, five. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Yeah. So then I said, well, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? But he couldn't see that. So we prayed another few minutes and then I held up some more fingers and he could see that right in front of his face. He could count fingers just in front of his face, but not, you know, even if it was a few feet away, he couldn't. So we prayed some more and then, and then I could stand a few feet away and he could count them. And then we prayed some more and then I'd stand like five, 10 feet away and he could count them. And, and this went on like that. And I was standing there just like kind of shocked blown away because now yeah. you're on the other side you're not the recipient of healing you are actually administering the healing yeah and and then the next one in line was the this young boy's younger brother who was also blind okay. and the same thing happened and so two in a row and so i remember walking back to my hotel that night and i took a picture of myself in the mirror and my jaw was just like halfway to the floor like mine right now yeah yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. and and i thought okay wait up all right i'm well let me check wait i still i still have all my faculties i'm still a scientist at a you know research university i don't think i've lost my marbles here but i know what i saw yeah. And that just continued to mess with my whole view of like what how does how does the world work? <laughs> how you does know? the world work? And it must have also given you a lot of hope for your own remedy and your own yeah. healing. It did. And and I think that's and that's partly what I was looking for is yeah. you know, is is there any hope? The, and of course, seeing a miracle gives you hope. It's it's it, it's not the same as actually, you know, experiencing healing yourself. But, mm-hmm. but I thought, well, if you know, if, if these what appear to be miracles seem to happen so, so often, maybe there's hope for me. And so, yeah. so I went back for a six month follow up MRI. Now six months after the diagnosis, and so I got the readings, and and the tumor hadn't grown, and I looked at it myself, and it you know, seemed to be just kind of sitting there. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. And mm-hmm. and after nine months, I looked at it and I thought that the, the, the reading, the radiologist reading said, well, there's no change. And I looked at it because I, <laughs> I look at a lot of MRI brain images as part yeah. of my work. So yeah. I looked at it and I thought that almost looks a little smaller, but it's just... It's hard to tell because sometimes the slices are taken at slightly different locations right. and it's it can be hard to interpolate between the slices. So anyway, by uh, by the twelve month follow up, so this is now, you know, getting to August or September of, of two thousand four, the radiology reading said, Huh, well it's not growing and it should have grown. I mean it's a tumor like this. Um, but it's not. So, wait, we're, you know, is this really a tumor? And, and now you have to understand that when I first got the diagnosis, we thought, well, maybe, you know, is there any chance this diagnosis could have been mistaken? So we had a, right. we had a friend who's a, who's a doctor at the hospital who 
called a favor with the head of radiology and we had him take another look and the head of radiology said, okay, there's, there's a 10% chance that this is a, some kind of weird focal infection. And if that's the case, then it'll go away within about three months, you know, but otherwise there's no question this is a tumor. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, both from the looks of it and the fact that you're, you're 30 years old, you never had a seizure in your life and suddenly you're having multiple seizures and we can see this thing right here and that typically causes seizures. So there's really no question. Mm-hmm. So that was the original uh, reading, and then we get to twelve months later, and it's like, well, huh? That's starting to rethink that maybe because it's not acting the way it was expected to. Yeah. So I continued having MRIs for seven years, and the last MRI I had at the seven-year mark, the radiologist looked at it and said, "All we see is a little bit of scar tissue and no tumor. No tumor." Seven years later. Seven years later, and that was now 20 years since I was diagnosed. The longest, to my knowledge, and I've looked through a lot of literature, the longest that anyone's ever survived with that kind of tumor ever, 17 years. Wow. So you are well, well beyond that. Well, thank God for that. (laughs) That's what I said. (laughs) And so during that time, did you attend healing services? Did you continue that that keen interest and that travel everywhere? I did. And I think after the the 12-month follow-up, when the MRI readings came back and it looked like this, this is not what it was originally, I thought, okay. Uh, you know, there's there's a bit of hope. And when you combine that with everywhere I went, I was seeing these kinds of miracles. I, I thought, you know, I like these people. I want to mm. hang out with them. And yeah. And you're making a difference yourself as well. That was also, I found very inspiring. Like, you know, here are people who are they're suffering, they're in pain. And, you know, whatever's going on, they're feeling better and their symptoms seem to be better. And and I thought, you know, how can I possibly explain, like, what is going on medically and, you know, in terms of biochemistry and all the biology of it? I don't really know, but mm-hmm. something's going on. And so I I made friends with a bunch of different groups. You know, it wasn't just one group. I'd travel with all sorts of different groups. And again, pretty much everywhere I went, I saw things like that, like what I'd seen in Cuba and Brazil. And it got to the point where... By around 2008, so about four years after the diagnosis, uh, my wife and I were talking and and we thought, you know, like if we're seeing all this, why is nobody doing careful research to see Mm -hmm. what's really going on? Like where are the doctors? Where are the scientists? And Mm -hmm. and at a certain point we thought, well, if no one else is going to do it, why don't we do it? Which is fantastic. It's it's kind of shocking that there hasn't been any really hard evidence-based research? Well, I wouldn't say there's been none, but it's been very sparse. Right. And I could probably spend more time than we have going into why that's the case. I think the short version is Christians who will see these miracles tend to be a little distrustful of science. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that goes back to things like the Scopes trial and Darwin and 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 likewise, scientists tend to be a little distrustful of Christians who, you know, make claims about miracles and, right. you know, for reasons which are understandable. Um, and I, I have this kind of strange feeling perspective in that I live in both worlds. I'm a Christian and I'm also, you know, a, a practicing scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, not a Christian scientist, that's different. Um, but yeah. but I live in both of these worlds. And yeah. so I see it from both perspectives. And and I think, you know, the from my perspective, Christians will tend to make a lot of claims and not really back them up. And the scientists and skeptic types will ask good questions and most of the time don't get really good answers. And mm-hmm. and I think, you know, if I'm a scientist and I make a claim about something, I better have evidence. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Or, somebody, or somebody's going to quite reasonably pick it apart uh, yeah. because that's what I would do if someone presented a claim without evidence. So uh, my wife and I heard that there was a group in Mozambique in in, in Africa 
and they claimed that for the last two years, every single healing meeting they'd had um, where there were deaf people, all the deaf people got healed, and most of the blind people besides. And so we thought, well, if we're going to study these phenomena, we should go where people are claiming they're happening. And so we got medical equipment, uh, you know, the what the audiologists would use to measure hearing thresholds. And we got eye charts that were specially made for people who can't read. And we went to Mozambique and spent two weeks there. And and so we go out in the bush and you know, this missionary lady would start preaching and and say, okay, you know, now bring me all the blind and deaf people. And so they come up. And and so I went down the line and measured their eyesight, measured their hearing. And then the missionary lady would pray for them. And then I would go down the line and measure them again. And I tried really hard to trick them and see if, you know, there was something that wasn't quite, you know, if they were kind of faking it or sandbagging it or, you know. Mm -hmm. And I got consistent readings. What it showed was basically that the the visual acuity was dramatically improved, and and not all of them, but a lot of them. And Mm -hmm. the hearing thresholds were dramatically better in a lot of them, um, going to the point where you could barely hear a motorcycle engine a foot away to where you can hear a whisper. Wow. And the thing is, in these villages, they all kind of know each other, and so they know who's blind and deaf. And when someone who's deaf gets a word whispered behind them and then repeats it, that makes quite an impression on the rest I of the I can village. imagine. <laughs> That's going to start the talk talking in the town. So I thought, okay, I, I've now been able to measure some of this, you know, my own hands, my yeah. own eyes right in front of me. And so we published a, an article in a peer-reviewed medical journal about that. What was the response? Because that's brave. At the time, uh, I, even though I collected the data and analyzed it, I, I'm only listed in the acknowledgments because I, I didn't have sufficient bravery at that point to put my okay. name on it as an author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, understandable. Uh, it's just interesting that, you know, you said you stand in both worlds. You stand in yeah. the world of faith and and in your Christianity, and you also stand in the world of science and medical science. And as we alluded to before, you know, the institute that you founded exists to bridge that gap between yeah. the science and the faith. But crossing that divide as, you know, a known scientist, medical scientist, neuroscientist, had to have taken some courage and some careful consideration. So how did the scientific community respond to this? Yeah. So for the for the article that we published on the, the study in Mozambique, it, it was kind of mixed and along the lines of what you'd expect. So there mm-hmm. were some some of the skeptical community who were skeptical, um, who I think basically raised every question and objection and potential confound they could think of. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, not, not just placebo effects, but but other things, Hawthorne effects, holdback effects. So a Hawthorne effect is where when somebody's looking at you and, and you know, you feel like the, somebody's watching you, you, you tend to perform better. Right. Um, and holdback effects are where you purposely perform worse than you're able initially and placebo effects and, and, and other things like that. And so we considered all of those and I I have to refer you to my wife's book. It's called testing prayer to really get into the details of that. Um, Okay. The, the, the study itself was published in the Southern medical journal in 2010 and that's available online. But I think the, the thing is in these communities in Africa, the oftentimes the local indigenous healers would charge a con, uh, based on contingency. So if you don't get healed, you don't pay. Okay. <laughs> and so and so that was kind of the culture. And so they would have every motivation to not look too healed because you would then have to pay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> At least it actually that's... serves the the study in some way. Yeah. Well, right. And or so, the veracity of it. Yeah. Yeah, so they they would have had really no reason to to try to look more healed than they were. Mm-hmm. And again, this, this is we could spend you know a whole podcast just on this. Um, but in the end, I think we we considered carefully all the potential confounds, and 
you can never say never, but there was no plausible explanation. And especially, Mm -hmm. you know, in some of the cases, we're looking at people whose eyes are white. And, you know, it's not just that they're saying they can't see. It's pretty clear. It's obvious to the observer that they can't see. Yeah. And did this ignite additional studies? For you and your wife, it certainly did. But did other people within the scientific world pick up on this and, and also get motivated to to look into it further from their perspectives? There have been a handful of of clinical trials that have been done over the last, I'd say, 25 years looking at what's the effect of prayer on health outcomes. And mm-hmm. there was a famous study that was done, it was published in 2006, uh, the Benson study on uh, cardiac patients. And the question was, d- does prayer help them uh, recover better? You know, what are the rate of complications? And and the the study basically had a negative result. And what they found was that when people didn't know they were being prayed for, the outcomes were no different from the control group. And when people did know they were being prayed for, they, they had more complications than the control group that wasn't being prayed for. And so oh. you'd look at that and you'd think, well, I don't know, that maybe maybe we shouldn't pray for people. You know, they feel nervous and maybe have more complications. And so when you look at the study, then you have to ask, well, you know, what what do they mean by prayer? Yes. And so the, the group, there, there were two groups doing the praying. Uh, there was the Unity Church and uh, and a group of Catholic nuns. And uh, let me qualify this. I mean, no disparagement to, to either of these groups. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's really scientifically a question of construct validity. And what that means is when you're measuring something, are you actually measuring the thing that you think you're measuring? Yes. If you look at what, for example, the Unity Church says about themselves, um, they basically don't believe in, you know, sort of divine healing. It's okay. basically you have to uh, look within yourself, um, but there's not a concept of of God as such healing people. And so if, if you're asking someone, okay, you know, uh, we're asking you to pray to God for someone's healing, and they don't believe that God does healing, then then now what are you measuring? And, and likewise with the, the the Catholic group, they had uh, praying. It, it it wasn't clear that they were praying in a way that the study was asking <laughs> them to pray. Um, right. So and, and that's another whole story. It it gets tricky to do these kinds of studies. There are other studies that have found positive results. Um, but, but again, it's just a handful, and the systematic reviews that look at the the liter- the scientific literature on this, have basically said, well, there's very few studies, and the evidence isn't strong, and and it you know it's not clear. So I don't know, maybe you shouldn't even bother doing more studies. Now, from my perspective, I thought, well, you got to me too late. You know, I've seen too many <laughs> too many things happen to to say, well, that that can't happen because mm-hmm. I've seen it happen. So exactly. And we and so now your institute, the Global Medical Research Institute, is filling that gap. Yes. So after we did the Mozambique study, uh, Candy, my wife, had written a book called Testing Prayer, which expanded on the Mozambique study and a number of other studies that uh, mostly she and and I'd helped with um, had done in Brazil and and parts of the U.S. and Canada and. Out of that book, uh, there were several people, um, uh, medical types, who contacted us and said, you know, we should scale this up. And so we got together, and, and that's how we formed the, the Global Medical Research Institute, which is a, it's a U.S. nonprofit, 501c3. And really, the goal of that is to do more of the kinds of careful studies that are necessary to figure out what's going on. And that really breaks down into two kinds of studies. Uh, One is clinical trials, and the other is case reports. As a a bit of a sort of philosophical detour on these, I think that there there are two general ways you can know something in terms of academic research and science. And the scientific method depends on 
experiments that you can do under controlled conditions and that are repeatable. Mm-hmm. And and the problem that you run into pretty quickly is that when someone claims they were miraculously healed, it's not a necessarily a repeatable event. In other words, you mm-hmm. can't, you know, if they were blind and now they can see, you can't go make them blind again, mm-hmm. or at least you shouldn't. Right, exactly. <laughs> you, you Ethical problems with that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, you know, create the same condition. Uh, I mean, we, we talk about this in terms of epistemology. So epistemology just means what's the way in which you know something. And the scientific method is one epistemology. It's mm-hmm. it's the way of knowing by which you set up control conditions and repeat the events and see if you get the same outcome. Mm-hmm. And we can't really do that with miracles in that way. So the other kind of method is what's called a historical epistemology, which means that, you know, for example, if I were to ask you who was the first president of the United States – it's not a, something that you can answer by repeating the conditions of the United States in the late 18th century. You know it rather by the historical method, which is also a valid epistemology. And mm-hmm. so we have good historical records that will pretty much establish beyond doubt that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And so you can look up those records and and that's how you do it. And so when we look at cases of miracles, we apply a, a medical historical epistemology. That is, we look at medical records and we ask, what can we and what can't we say about what happened, about what the original medical condition was, about what the condition was after the healing? Uh, what can we and what can we not conclude? And and so, when we look at case reports of miraculous healings, we apply that method. Uh, we, we're also working on clinical trials where we do set up control conditions. We have randomized control groups, uh, and we do ask, you know, does prayer lead to some kind of measurable improvement in health outcomes? And mm-hmm. and so there are studies like that, um, and we're doing more of those now. Uh, but but those are the two main things that we focus on. And and I think when we look at cases of, you know, someone said, oh, I experienced this miracle. There are some cases where we look at that and every case will, uh, you know, if it gets that far, we'll run it by medical specialists. We'll get you know, all the medical records straight from the hospitals and doctor's offices with the patient's permission, of course. And, yeah. and, we, and we preserve anonymity. So, you know, if we end up publishing a case report in a scientific journal, we don't reveal the name of the person who it was um, right. because, you know, that's that's just standard ethical practice. Mm-hmm. So, But it's a huge contribution to the understanding of the power of prayer and miraculous healing. It's, it's yeah. really important work. Yeah, well, thanks. And I think not every case that we look at uh, is one that we would say, oh, you know, there's no good medical explanation for how that happened, you know, apart from a miracle. In some cases, it seems like it was a miracle, but when you look at it more closely and you get medical experts to look at it, they'll say, well, actually, it could have been this, and you can't rule out that, and that, you know, sometimes that happens medically, and so it's it's maybe uncommon, and that's great that they recovered, but, you know, mm-hmm. can you rule out a more mundane medical explanation? And in and, and a lot of cases, no. Right. And and I think those are also useful and interesting. Uh but but there are cases where we run it by a bunch of medical specialists and there is no medical explanation that that anyone any specialist can come up with that could say, you know, oh yeah, it could happen that way. Um and so those are the cases that uh, we end up publishing uh, as the most remarkable. Mm-hmm. And so we publish a number of those and have more coming out. I can't wait to read them myself. So, Dr. Brown, I'm curious, do you foresee a time when neuroscience and divine healing could intersect in practice? Yeah, I thought about this a lot. And I think usually when you see someone claiming the authority of neuroscience to validate some kind of, you know, supernatural or metaphysical claim, it's it's something like, you know, for example, within Christian Pentecostal and charismatic faith traditions, there's this practice of of speaking in tongues you know right. it's technically glossolalia and and there have been a few studies where people have put some subjects in a functional mri scanner uh, which is what i use for my research and ask them to speak in tongues or carry out their spiritual practice and they find that there's activation in certain parts of the brain 
I look at those studies and, and the question I have is, so what does that tell us? And I really don't know what it tells us mm. because anytime you do anything, the mere fact that you're doing something means there's going to be some change in activity in some part of your brain. Right. And so the fact that somebody did something in a scanner and there was a change in the brain activity doesn't mean that, you know, they're now having a mystical experience that can only be described in supernatural terms. I don't think it means that at all. And so I think there's a danger at functional MRI images are seductive because you have a black and white brain and really bright orange colors on them. But I think you have to be careful and not go beyond what's claimed, uh, you know, or, or what the evidence supports. And I just, I don't think that some of these studies are really justifying what uh, what the people doing them would like to claim. Now, having said that, I think neuroscience broadly defined, if you include uh, neurosurgery and neurology and the more medical aspects of things, so I tend to do more pure science, but if you include the more patient-facing things, I think there is definitely a role in the sense that when someone claims that a miracle happened, you know, such as a brain tumor disappeared, well, that's a question for the medical evidence. And I think that's where for GMRI, we depend on medical specialists to help us evaluate the claims. And so we, we have neurologists that we call on. And I very much value that, that particular set of expertise for helping us sort of separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see the most uh, use there. Right. We know that the power of prayer is not infallible. And not everybody can be saved. Have you yet an idea what factors determine who benefits from divine healing and who does not? I was really curious about that. Yeah, yeah, great question. I think I've seen a lot of people uh, apparently experience miraculous healing. Um, and I've seen a lot of people who, despite much prayer, have not and, right. and have in some cases passed away. Of course, when this comes up, you know, if you start talking about miracles, you have to ask, well, what about the people who don't experience right. it? And and I think in the end, I don't really have any set of deterministic criteria. If you do this, that, or the other, then you will experience a miracle. Mm -hmm. But I have seen that there are situations in which uh, the, the, the probability that, you know, I'll see someone who will claim to experience a miracle is higher in certain settings. And those settings, uh, those settings seem to involve situations in which there it's a there's a religious service, there's a a particular message that's being preached, uh, so a kind of gospel message, and particularly a message that uh Jesus still heals people. Mm -hmm. And I think now in part that uh, to have a preacher preach that kind of message will have, in part, the effect of raising a kind of expectation, uh, which itself can contribute to placebo effect. Right. But there are, those are the situations in which I'd also seen things that I don't know how I would explain in terms of a placebo effect. And so I think situations in which there is a, a kind of a gospel message, mm -hmm. uh, that's by far when I've seen the most things that look like miracles. So I think it, that raises other interesting questions, you know, like, well, you know, what about with other religious faiths? You know, would you expect a similar? I mean, there was a Netflix special a while back where this, you know, magician showman guy was, uh, you know, sort of getting, he had a big crowd and he got them all excited and said, you know, well, you know, have you experienced some healing? And, and people were, you know, apparently to their surprise reporting that they felt better. And, and so I think there's not really a question that there's a certain amount of what some scholars call collective effervescence that can create a, a collective atmosphere that will lead people to feel better. But I think, again, the situations in which people not just feel better, but have some kind of remarkable medical recovery that when you look at the medical records really can't be explained in terms of modern medicine and what, what we know about disease and time courses of disease. Uh, that, I think, is a little more remarkable. And those also seem, in my experience, to be much more likely in these kinds of you know gospel meeting settings. And I think, ultimately, I'm still 
trying to figure out what are what are the situations in which these are most likely, and that's part of why we have this research program. Wow. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I could go on for hours. I actually have so many questions, but we're going to have to let you go. I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Brown. It's been fascinating. Um, we just can't wait to learn more about your work as it progresses. If you'd like to learn more about the Global Medical Research Institute, you can visit them at their website at www.globalmri.org forward slash. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, that was fascinating. I will be following Dr. Brown's work very closely. Oh, me too. So what do you think, Harris? Do you think healing through prayer is possible? Well, I'm certainly inclined to now, Walker. Yeah, I believe in the power of prayer. But does it work all the time? Unfortunately, no. Mm. Why can't we believe in both medical science and prayer, though? Right. Would I pass a medical treatment in favor of prayer alone? Not at all, but I feel we are just scratching the surface of what we know about the brain. As I've said, you know, quite a few times already, and we'll likely say again, just warning you. (laughs) Right. And how much do we really know about the soul? Well, we don't know what we don't know. It always boggles my mind that so many people feel that they have to abandon faith to believe in science. Right. But it's not really one camp or another. I mean... Aren't all known scientific facts once rooted in the faith of those who conceived of them? Well, Tanya Lombardo's article debates this very idea. There are certainly plenty who are of the opinion that science does not require faith, but she does mention some scientists who think otherwise. For instance, Dr. Cullen Buey, a professor of engineering at MIT, said, Some would have you think that faith and reason are like oil and water. This simply isn't the case. Some of the greatest minds in history have employed faith to advance the frontiers of science. Many of the greatest scientists in history are people with a deep faith, not just in their science, but also in God. Exactly. If faith is employed as an assumption that something is true, then it follows that science does require it. Mm -hmm. She thinks people get stressed out about how faith is defined because, in her words, something about the relationship between science and religion seems to be at stake. Yeah, and again, it's not a one or the other or an all or none thing. Each camp seems to be afraid of giving ground to the other. People seem to feel that there is faith and there is reason but that they can't share that same space. Mm, Harris, did you know that not believing is the second biggest belief in the United States? Like atheists? Well, a little more broad, actually. It also includes the non-religious, non-believers, and agnostic. Oh, like myself. I've always muddled up the terms of atheist and agnostic. Right. Johnny Thompson, who was a philosophy lecturer at Oxford, has stated that a lot of those who call themselves atheists are actually agnostic. Right. Yeah. Not religious and yet still have faith in something spiritual. Right. Like, for example, in some countries such as China, some ascribe to ancestor worship, folk belief, and what Thompson refers to as quasi-religious traditional medicine. People in this category could also believe in angels, fairies, karma, you know, a divine plan, a soul, ghosts, spirits, or even Ouija boards. Right. And that fits me to a T, (laughs) especially the ghost walker, as you know. I do. This feels comfortable to me, too. (laughs) It's one reason I don't mess around with Ouija boards. Right. That's a wise decision. (laughs) I've seen enough horror movies to know that these are not toys, but they're sold in toy stores. Mm. I've used one once or twice, but nothing really happened. Well, if you played with one, you might need to beef up your belief in angels. I believe in them, but I'm not sure about fairies, although I do like the idea of them. I know. There's still a lot of societies out there that believe in magical creatures that coexist with nature. And often they can be quite meddlesome, Walker. Yes, a lot of this has to do with the afterlife or the great unknown, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I love the idea of karma and souls. Mm. I absolutely believe in souls. I've read a lot of quite credible cases which have convinced me. And I'm with you on the ghost, Harris. Yeah, but faith is not always defined as belief in the supernatural or unknowable. James Valentine believes in more virtuous aspects of humanity, which he outlines in his article, I'm not religious, but my faith is beyond belief. Valentine says that his faith is more in the realm of love, hope, truth, and fellow humans. He says, I'm driven by wonder, joy, curiosity, knowledge, wisdom. I believe in equality of opportunity of education, of access to water, food, shelter, I believe in human rights, the rule of law, voting, and respect. These are all good things. 
This interpretation of faith in human virtues might resonate with more people now than ever before, I'd think. Yeah. In fact, this form of faith is what is referred to as secular faith. Mm -hmm. Valentine's faith is secular based on personal community-driven values. Secular faith is very personal. Yeah. His belief system appears to be quite humanist. Mm -hmm. And humanist thinking is based on reason, as well as a very strong empathetic approach to people and the natural world. Right. Humanist International says humanists based their understanding of the world on reason and science, rejecting supernatural or divine beliefs. Humanists reject all forms of racism and prejudice and believe in respecting and protecting everyone's human rights, including the right to freedom of religion and belief. It is even thought that science itself can inspire faith in the secular form. So how is this? Consider the theory of evolution. Supposedly, it encompasses faith in natural selection. Or even consider faith in political parties. This faith is driven by most often secular values. Faith in politics. Hmm. Those two words in the same sentence make me a little uncomfortable. Yeah, me too. But frankly, the values of Western society do tend to be intertwined with religious, spiritual, and secular beliefs, past or present. It's like a big ball of yarn to untangle. I think faith ebbs and flows over time, but ultimately is constant. Yeah, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Faith can wear many faces, like the faith people of all walks have in manifestation. You know, if you believe it, it will be. Ah, yes, manifestation used to be so fringe, now it's popping up everywhere. So do you believe in manifestation? I certainly do, but I'm not sure how much success I've had. With it. I'm an eternal optimist, though, so I keep trying. What about you? Well, I think there's definitely something to it. I mean, I believe in the power of positive thinking, and I don't think manifestation is all that different. Too true. Manifesting is big, and particularly among millennials and Gen Zers. According to Fortune magazine, the manifest hashtag has had 26 billion views on TikTok. Wow. Celebrity Jim Carrey has faith in manifestation, Walker. He often tells the story that he wrote a check for himself for 10 million bucks in 1985. He dated it for 10 years later and kept it in his wallet. Then, 10 years later, in November 1995... Carrie found out he was cast in the movie Dumb and Dumber, which is a classic, (laughs) for $10 million. I've heard this story. No surprise that he has faith in the fact that he can manifest his own destiny, is it? None at all. So why do you think manifesting is so popular? Well, I think it revives hope and brings a little bit of more certainty and sense of control to people's lives. It's a tough world out there. It sure is. Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, director of the world's first degree in happiness studies at Centenary University, told Fortune, we open the news and we're bombarded with so much information and so many atrocities that are outside of our control. Suddenly, here comes a different philosophy, a promise of control, as opposed to a reality of lack of control. He also said that the less control we feel over global events, the more control we try to find over personal events. So that's manifestation. But what about faith in ourselves, like the intrepid Franklin D. Roosevelt. Right. As I say, if you can't have faith in yourself, who will? Right. Easier said than done, though, for so many Mm. people. Faith in oneself is different than self-confidence and self-esteem, too. It seems like a knowing, but really, it's probably born from your lifetime of experiences. If you've experienced abuse or trauma, your sense of self might be totally shaken. And likewise, if you've been able to rely on yourself in dire and difficult circumstances, this might strengthen the faith that you have in yourself. Perhaps this isn't a very good example, Walker, but I escaped a fire in third year university and it was terrifying. And I had to climb down several stories of this building on a tiny ladder that was affixed to the wall. But that experience gave me faith Mm. that I can and will act quickly in the best interest of myself and other people in life and death situations. I can see that. That faith takes away some uncertainty for you in the event bad things do happen. Yeah. I've read that faith allows us to get past the fear that things may happen, such as accidents or mishaps, whenever we have to do something. It will enable us to remove negativity from our minds, hoping that everything will be okay. Because no matter how skilled and good we are, we cannot precisely control many things around us. Too true. We all do go about our daily lives having faith of some kind without even realizing it, don't we? We do. And faith offers a lot. It helps us to manage stress and anxiety. It helps us cope and to keep going, Harris. 
Catherine Pulsifer might have said it best. She said, Faith is unseen but felt. Faith is strength when we feel we have none. Faith is hope when all seems lost. Faith Walker, I'm keeping it. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, you would be a real gem if you would rate and review our show. It helps us to grow and expand our reach. You can also subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can find us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker or visit us at www.athomeandabroadpodcast.com. We have great merch, I'm just saying. And of course, we would love to hear from you. And for you truly dedicated fans who have listened all the way to the end of this episode, we offer exclusive interviews, outtakes, challenges, and more on our paid channel, not even the cost of a latte once a month, depending on where you buy your coffee.